This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble 
sinners, what Jesus said is recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding, by not holding to false views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being free from all sense desires, is not born again in this world. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Oh, what good fun it is. No, sometimes chanting can be really boring. <laughs> but when you put energy into it, it becomes good fun. Okay, what have we got here today? Da -da -da. Questions. Shuffle them all up. Okay, let's see what we've got here. Question. Dear Ajahn Brahm, you mentioned we should let go of wanting, but how about wantings that are positive, like wanting to help people? Are there noble wantings? No, I don't like that question. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be nice to do that, wouldn't it? Okay. You like nice wanting, wantings that are, po are they really positive? Many people, they want things and they think they're doing a good job. There's one gentleman, and he just wants to make America great again. <laughs> <laughs> so wantings that are positive, wanting to help people, are noble wantings. You know that sometimes, if it's wanting which comes from loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, equanimity, the four Brahma Viharas, those are noble wantings. Because imagine, imagine you're fully enlightened. You've got no more wanting left. So what are you going to do? What's done is left to be done. So what are you going to do? So what drives the uh, enlightened being is wanting? Compassion, loving kindness, sympathetic joy. Otherwise, there's no point. Which is why... If you become fully enlightened and there's nothing much to do anymore, especially if you're a lay person, that's it. Seven days and <laughs> you can't sustain life. No point. There's nothing to drive it along anymore. Interesting. That's what it said. And first of all, I said, that doesn't make sense. Once you understand what keeps your life going, what drives it, wanting. If you're wanting something useful, wonderful, like loving kindness, but it's so often people have loving kindness without any wisdom. They think they're helping people, but are they? That is one of the reasons. There was, oh, one of these stories I read in a nature magazine so many years ago, and it was a child, uh, he was profoundly deaf, couldn't hear anything. And uh, the parents would take him to see the doctor once a year or once every six months to check that he was okay, but he was uh, profoundly deaf. So what happened, that after he was about seven or eight years of age, his GP you know, said he just you know, looked in one of the, the medical magazines that there was a procedure which actually you know, might fit your child as 10% chance of working. One in 10 kids, you know, wouldn't do anything at all. But maybe, who knows? And, you know, it's not an expensive procedure, and it's not all that invasive, and a bit of anesthetic, or as I said the other day, if you run out of anesthetic, that's even cheaper. <laughs> that's only a joke, by the way. They don't do those <laughs> things. Don't worry. So, and anyway, so, uh, the parents talked it over with the GP and said, oh, yeah, why not? Nothing to lose. You know, one in ten chance he might get his hearing back. 
and that child was one of those 10%. After the operation, he got his hearing back. Actually, not back, got it for the first time. And as soon as he could hear, he got so angry at his parents. Why didn't you ask me to hear? You just assumed that hearing was good. But for me, it's just noise. I think that this is sign language or whatever. It's just noise. I never wanted to hear. Now, just having my hands and my eyes, that was enough for me in feeling. I didn't need that extra sense to worry about now. And it was a true story, and it really shocked me. Why didn't they ask the kid, first of all, whether it wanted to hear? Just assume that someone who is profoundly deaf is somehow disadvantaged. It wasn't. That child was very happy how it was, and he got upset and angry that people had made assumptions and never even asked him whether he wanted to hear. But that's one of the trouble. Wanting to help people, are you really helping people? Are you wise enough to know what people really want and what they really need? Or do you just make the life more complicated? Dear Ajahn, you studied theoretical physics. What made you give it up? Uh, what made you to give up as it happened? Oh, give up will, or it happened as a free will, automatic process. In our case, do we have to let go of our will one day, or will it happen automatically for us too? You can't give up. You, the will can't give up the will. Who's giving up the will? You're going to decide to give up the will, and that's more will. Well, it gets very complicated. So after a while, what one does is, oh, just you know, leave the will alone. Don't worry about it. Don't even get involved in it. Little by little, your will gets softer. You become less of a control freak. When you get a strong will, you become a control freak. And many people, they start off just trying to maybe, you know, control their, maybe their siblings in the family. Later on, they go and get married, they try and control their spouse. Then they start a company and they start controlling the company. And then they become a politician and they start controlling their constituents. And then they become a, a prime minister, and then they try and control that. And then they go and control the world. And then they die, and they want to challenge God to be the controller of the universe, master or mistress of the universe. What are you doing that for? Because controlling causes so much frustration. You can't even control your own body, let alone other people. But we have this illusion that if I can control others, then I can have some peace and happiness. Remember the Buddha under the Bodhi tree, before he became enlightened, Mara came up and said, stop being enlightened. Instead, being what they call the wheel-turning monarch. You've got all of the great uh, qualities. You can be this emperor, this beneficial ruler who will create peace and harmony in this world, who can abandon, get rid of poverty. You can do so much for this world. And the Bodhisattva said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, been there, done that. How many people go into life thinking they're going to do something good in life? Yeah, sometimes people do that, but then you go in there and sometimes it's so hard to do good stuff. People get in the way, they just misunderstand your intentions. You're trying to make compromises and then people misunderstand you. And then in the end, and most politicians, they get so frustrated and depressed. They're trying to do something, but too many compromises. 
And this is what happened. It was the old um, saying, uh, Lord Acton, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. So what do you expect with a Donald Trump or, or with a God? It corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. That's one of the reasons why. If you want to actually use your willpower, after a while, you know, you just uh, get people out of the way because you're doing something good. So you think, even Mr. Hitler's final solution, he really thought it was the right thing to do. Uh, Roosevelt, um, was it Truman? No, it's, yeah. They, I think it's Truman who dropped the atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Thought that was needed to end war. So many people do some terrible, terrible things, thinking it's the kindest thing to do. Very dangerous when you have power and wanting. So, one of the reasons this. Where are we going here? That's one of the reasons why the will looks like it can be your friend. But it turns against you. That's why there is another way, which is letting go. Being kind. Being peaceful. Until you can learn how to sit here and nothing move. Not a will happening in a few moments, for a few moments, so you're not moved at all. You're still and peaceful. And that is a wonderful thing to actually experience. Stillness. Real peace. And there's nothing to make you move <coughs> until it comes up again and makes you move. You can look upon the will, I sometimes call it the winds of wanting. They blow you around, thinking that it's going to get you somewhere. You just go round and round and round and round. And those winds of wanting, just the, your mind is like that wonderful lake. And the winds, they whip up the waves on the surface. You have ripples, disturbances on the lake because of the wind. And because the lake is all disturbed, you can never see an accurate reflection in the water of the moon and stars. It's distorted. The life is bent because you've got too much agitation on the surface. But imagine that the waves are perfectly still. There is no wind blowing. Then that lake, it appears <coughs> like glass. And you see a perfect reflection like a mirror of the moon and the stars and nature all around. Only through stillness do you see things as they truly are. And the way to stillness is just stopping wanting for a little while. Everything you wanted, you find you get when you stop wanting it. One of the sayings, it could be as said by the Buddha, it's one of those lovely ways of explaining the Four Noble Truths. And it is, when you want something more, you can't enjoy what you already have. You can't appreciate this moment when you want something more. You can't have any happiness or peace. When you appreciate this moment, have you ever had those great moments in your life when you, you could be anywhere? You could be even in an airport waiting for your aircraft to take off. Or you may be just, you know, in the, sitting down by the, having a cup of tea just the outside the kitchen. You could be just, you know, in some place just sitting down watching the sun go down. And those moments, you don't want to be any other place in the whole world with any other people at any other time, and just right in this moment, with the people you're with, the time you're with. 
those moments of perfect contentment. It doesn't last, but in those moments, if a genie came up and said, you've got three wishes, what would you want? And you'd say to the genie, no, nick off, get out of here. I don't want any wishes, I'm happy right now. Don't spoil it. You have those moments? You like contentment, just happy to be here. In those moments, you don't need to be, you know, your football team has won or you're, you know, you've just fallen in love or just, you know, you've just got a, a raise in salary. Those times of contentment, you don't need much. You're sitting here having a wonderful lunch, no rush. You haven't got to go to work afterwards. You're sitting down there enjoying a beautiful lunch, just watching, just watching the crowds go by. Moments of contentment are moments of freedom from wanting. You notice your will. It just stop for a little while. Just being here. Those are great moments of insight, what they call taste of freedom. And it does happen automatically after a while. The reason was not that automatic. The reason your will stops from time to time is because I brainwash you. <laughs> and after a while it happens. It's this is good. Unexpected. Dear Ajahn Brahm, kindly please explain us the story of the Buddha when the Buddha is holding a flower and smiling and only available Mahakasapa understands the Dharma. That is nowhere to be found in the suttas. That was a, a Zen story. It's not in the suttas at all. Yeah, made up. So it's interesting, sometimes these legends come down. They're not there at all. But, this a matter of it's in the suttas, what could it mean? The Buddha holds a flower and smiling. Only Mahakasapa understands. What, what type of flower could it be? It was probably, uh, what flower could it be? It could be, uh, what type of flowers do you like? It may be like be a cauliflower, and he's hungry. <laughs> he wants something to eat, so he's smiling. <laughs> now that sometimes there is such a thing as transmission. This is supposed to be only Vajrayana, or even Mahayana, but it's there in Theravada as well. Sometimes it's the brainwashing. You hold up a flower. We don't really hold up a flower. The thing which did enlighten a lot of people was not a flower, but like a candle. And then the wind blew. It went out. Where did it go? Those were really interesting ones. Well, quite a few people got enlightened that way. Oof. That. But holding a flower coming up, maybe it was because, you know, a flower... You know, just when you hold up a flower, after a little while, it starts to all fall apart. It doesn't last. But one of the best flowers I've ever seen, there's one flower which is, uh, grows in, in Australia. And honestly, it looks absolutely beautiful. This beautiful yellow, deep flower, absolutely gorgeous. But it smells of dog poo. <laughs> Because it uses uh, flies to pollinate. So it doesn't use bees, because wherever it sort of evolved, there wasn't any bees around. So it uses flies. And so it really looks like it's, it smells like it's dog poo. And all these flies, and they're attracted to it, and they get inside it, and they mess around, and, and the pollen gets on their body, and they go to the next flower, it smells like dog poo, and they go there. And it's the most beautiful flower, the most disgusting smell. <laughs> and I always remember that because at our temple in Nolamara, I went in there on a Friday and I was smelling, so somebody's you know, trodden the dog poo. And I, you know, I checked all the shoes 
no dog poo on any of the shoes. This is weird. How did they get it in here? And he couldn't see any marks of dog poo on the carpet. So like any good scientist, you know, you smell and you're aware it got stronger and stronger. And then I thought it was a flower. The person who'd offered it for us that day, <laughs> he'd even put it on the shrine. <laughs> he had a cold that day, so he couldn't <laughs> smell anything. We could. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that. It's a really interesting flower. So maybe that's the one which the Buddha held up to Mahakasapa. <laughs> It may look beautiful, but it smells <laughs> like dog shit. So anyway, that's my interpretation. Dear Bante, where do unborn babies go? What can we do for them? Sometimes they come back again. Yes, a lovely little story. There was, uh, sorry, some of you know these people, so be careful. There was this um, uh, Thai couple and got pregnant and you know, everything was going well. She was looking forward to her first child, really you no know, good care. You know, only about three or four or five days beforehand, had an ultrasound. Everything was perfect, getting very excited for the birth. But when she delivered, it was stillborn. Just in the last few hours before birth, the baby had twisted and cut off its blood supply in the umbilical cord. So it was stillborn. And they were obviously disappointed and sad, but I had the honour of doing the funeral for them. Or for the baby, not for them. And <laughs> can't rush myself. And so I did the funeral for this little baby. It's, it's a fully formed kid. So they actually dressed it up, you know, it was just like an ordinary baby. And they called it Charlie. And in the funeral part, I still remember that was in uh, in Wanneroo Road, uh, uh, just south of the ro the Reed Highway, Barano Day funeral uh, place, and they actually held the, the the coffin up, open coffin, and they held it just and they leaning backwards a little bit, just so it could get in the family photograph you know, with me. So at least Charlie could get in the photograph. But there was only just a bit of bad fortune. That's all. So. A few months later, she became pregnant again. And shortly afterwards, oh, is that Charlie back again? Because often that happens. They don't make it in the first time into your womb, into your life, and the next time they have another go. And they didn't tell me at first, but they told me afterwards, before the birth happened, that when no one was looking, they took a, a pen, a ballpoint pen, and they drew a line on the baby's heel. A birthmark, a line. So, if it came back again, they could recognize it. I'm sure as, as anything, when they gave birth, a healthy kid, now this time I think they gave him lots of ultrasounds just to make sure that they didn't mess up this time, gave birth to a girl called Annie with a birthmark on its heel, exactly where they, they, they put it. It was Charlie, came back again. But interesting, as a boy. And, because you know, I knew all the stories, I didn't try and tell too many people, but you always watched it. And when it came to temple in Nolamara, it would actually run around and beat up the girls and play with the boys. <laughs> you know, it's like, it was a tomboy and I knew why it was a tomboy, because it was a boy before. It was Charlie before, now it was Annie. For the first few years, and then after a few years, and it just identified with being a girl. That's amazing, you can see those things happening in the real life. And it's got the birthmark on its heel. So where do the babies go if they you know, die young like that? They, s they have another go. It's just the same as if you, you know, you're going back, you know, after this retreat, you're going back to, say, Jakarta on Air Asia, and you find that they've overbooked. They've overbooked, so they call you, you get bumped off the flight. They can't accommodate all of you. So they ask, you know, does anybody just, you know, give up their seats? 
so you can't actually get on the aircraft, but what happens? The next flight out, you get priority, and you also get upgrade. So Charlie, I know the men don't like me saying this, was a boy before, but you know, he didn't quite get into this life, so he had another go, and he got an upgrade to a girl. <coughs> You go, yeah, yeah, I jump well, yeah. We <laughs> 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 got the upgrade. That was really wonderful to see, and you actually see it in there. So that's sometimes unborn babies go, sometimes they get another try. It's like they've almost got enough karma to come into life. They don't quite make it. But of course, you know, some ladies have abortions. And please, you know, don't sort of uh, um give yourself a hard time over that because sometimes you are, as they say, in a very difficult position. And you know, all the ladies which I have talked to, you know, deeply about sort of abortions terminating their pregnancies, it's not something they do easily. They always they, they think about it, worry about it. And so it's one of the most difficult decisions. And any of you who are the same gender as I, male. You can't understand just what a woman has to go through at that time. You can just you can get a little bit of an idea of their pain. So, you know, it's one of the most difficult decisions. And because it's not done lightly, it's not you know, as bad karma as if you just mindlessly just go and kill someone just because you don't like the way they look. This is a very difficult decision, and we have a lot of compassion for women in those situations. And the worst thing is, uh, you know, you're already going through a lot of pain, just making that decision, and then having to be told by other people, you're a bad girl. And mostly it's by men who say you're a bad girl. So I'll never do that. You must understand it's a difficult decision. Next time, don't get yourself in such a position you have to make that um, that choice ever again. You know, use um, contraceptives. You know, make sure you know you just uh, you stand your ground if somebody just wants to you know have sex with you and it's not the right time for you or whatever. You know because the guy just walks away. But you know you're stuck with that fear in your womb for such a long time. It's a difficult decision. So and if you do make that decision, I often tell I can't make that decision for a person. But I just, you know, counseled young girls and middle-aged girls as well and just told them, look, I will never, ever judge you for that choice, whichever way you go. But I'd always, my job as a monk, as a friend, is to care for you and just to be there for you before and afterwards, no matter what decision. And if you do make the decision that you have to terminate the pregnancy, that being is not just gone forever. You know, they have a good chance of coming back into your life or somebody else's life. They almost made it into this world, but not quite. So, number one, forgive yourself. Acknowledge, forgive, and learn not to get yourself in that position again. And number two, can you uh, do something about it by you know, maybe giving a donation, not to a temple, but maybe to an orphanage or something. Something where there are kids who don't have parents, and maybe you can actually help out there. It can't be your kid, but some kid. So what that does, it actually makes you feel a bit better, and then you do something good, so something good comes out of the experience. But the worst thing is just feeling bad about yourself. So please don't do that. Get some forgiveness. And anyway, the unborn babies, they come back again. They have another chance. Dear Ajahn, why does love make suffering? <laughs> why, if we meet and falling in love with someone and the feeling so strong because of karma, that bring the feeling arise and grow together? Because that, you know, sometimes you fall in love with someone and they don't fall in love with you. <laughs> And that happens very often. But 
the actual process of love, sometimes it is something very powerful and karmic from the past. But you know, it's, it's not very romantic, but it's actually some of the, the science of love and falling in love. I'm talking about just the love where you really want to get together. And that was like a love, they say, you, the chemistry of love. You don't love the person, you love the way they make you feel. You actually feel high in their presence. And it is a chemical thing. You know, the smells, facial features, it, uh, it, um, it does uh, get hormones coming out of your body. And a lot of times that love, I mean, it's, it must, it's not very romantic to say it, but you actually you love the way they make you feel in their presence. It's a chemical reaction. The pheromones. And then that gets into your, your nose, into your body, and it sort of gives you a high. But like any sort of chemical-induced pleasure, after a while, you get a tolerance for it. She doesn't or he doesn't turn you on to the same intensity that she used to. Same person, they haven't changed their character. You don't get so excited in their presence. And apparently, it takes about two years on average. Except if you have a kid. And if you have a baby, the three of you, man, wife, and child, that creates more um, hormonal, uh, chemical-induced reactions between the three of you. And that keeps you together. And I was saying it's just very cold, but you know, it is the fact that if you know, man meets a boy meets girl, they don't have a kid within a couple of years, it's as if like, like the nature just wants you to separate so you can find someone else where you do have a kid. So it's just a selfish gene which wants you to procreate. And if the two of you come together and you don't have a baby, then just the love falls apart because you have to look for somebody else to, to regenerate your, your, um, your genetic line. It's a very interesting article, but there's a lot to that. So, you know, after you, know, you fall in love, madly in love, but it, it wears out after a while. Unless there's something else going on. And that's something else going on, of course, it's taking that love to a, 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 a better level, a deeper level. Not just I love the way you make me feel, not a sexual love, but more like a kindred spirit love where, you know, that uh, you have the same sort of um, ideas, the same sort of... Um, joys where you're these amazing best friends. And if you find someone like that, you know, that really is a best friend, that, you know, the two of you, you just, you just, you are matched. In other words, you like doing the same things, you know, not exactly the same things, but you enjoy the same type of pursuits, not all the time, but, you know, like you, you have the same interests. And if you have that, then, of course, now, one of the best ways of loving, I, I mentioned this, that when you choose a partner for life, you, know, you go out together, you test each other out, you know, you just get to know one another, whether this is the person for you or not the person. You spend a lot of time before you commit in a marriage. But if you have a kid, and a kid comes you know, out of your womb, into your life, you love them unconditionally forever. You don't choose your children, and you will always love them. You choose your husband or wife. You pay a lot of time trying to choose them, but do you love them forever? <laughs> What's the difference there between a child and a partner? Why? Our child sometimes is a pain in the neck, but they're my kid, and you will always love them. But your partner is a totally different type of love. So the love of 
uh, a child, if you can get your your um, partner, you know, to be just you know the same way that you look at your your kid or your partner, they're just so close to you. It becomes to that level of love of unconditional love. Whatever you do in your life, however you turn out to be, I will always love and care. That's very wonderful when a relationship actually you know, gets to that level. Whatever you do in your life, darling, just the door of my heart will always be open to you. My friend, or my partner. It's not so much romance anymore. It's not just the way you make me feel. It's uh, something much deeper. And that's the same as many people have towards their children. So there's different types of love. So why love also makes suffering? One of the other reasons is when you first fall in love, you know, you're that third one of those components of existence, perception, the mirage. You don't see what's there. You see what you want to see in your partner. I don't know many of you may have your kids and they say, oh, mommy, I've met this incredible guy. He's so wonderful. And he likes me too. I'm so lucky that this amazing guy is going to go out with me. And then you look at that guy, him. <laughs> what do you see in him? <laughs> because when you fall in love, all you can ever see is the most wonderful qualities in the person you fall in love with. They're just beautiful. They're wonderful. And... It's one of the reasons why you always fall in love. Where, where do you actually fall in love? Where do you go for romance? In a candlelit dinner. <laughs> in a walk by the river under the moonlight. Or in a dark nightclub. And I often notice why are the places you fall in love always dark? <laughs> <laughs> and it's obvious, because you can't really see what you're falling in love with. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, hap what's actually happening is that your fantasies and dreams, they can actually... Right, this all, no, in, the, in, the, in the sort of the bright sunlight, middle of the day, that guy looks just so ordinary. <laughs> but you know, in the moonlight, it's like Bruce Willis is so tough, <laughs> so sexy. <laughs> the same with the girl. There's uh, so much truth in that. But anyway, you also just have this, uh, this one lady <laughs> said, there's actually, it happened to her, and she, when she got married, <laughs> her, her father took her new husband aside. He said, son-in-law, you probably think my daughter is so beautiful and amazing. Oh, yeah, she's the most wonderful person in the whole of Singapore. The f no, that she married me, I'm just the luckiest man, not in Singapore, in the whole world. Oh, she's just gorgeous. She's wonderful in every which way. She's so kind and gentle and lovely. And even the way she picks her nose is so cute. <laughs> <laughs> I made it. She never said that. I made that one up. <laughs> but that's, wh that's when the father-in-law told the son-in-law, son-in-law, that's what it's like when you first fall in love. Your partner is the most amazing, perfect person in the whole world. But in one or two years' time, you will start to notice the faults and defects in my daughter. I know them. I'm a, I'm a dad. I know that those faults and defects. But, son-in-law, always keep this in mind. When you start to notice her defects, please remember she never had those faults to begin with, i.e. now, she would have married somebody much better than you. <laughs> 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 it's funny, it's like, 
Of course, she's defective. Because he's defective. That's why you're a match. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why I think oh, they're perfect. They're always perfect, lovely. Anyway. Anyway, that's why love makes suffering, because at the beginning it's a bit of a delusion. You know, it's one of the interesting things that these days that people actually live together for a while. Well, they actually really get to know one another, so they don't have any illusions anymore, at least a few illusions of what they're going to gonna marry. And in other words, you know, they, they test it out to see whether they're really compatible. How to overcome fear, trauma, and phobia. Can meditation help? Oh, yeah, it's easy. Just remember, what did I say first of all? Ajahn Brahm is here. No fear. Trauma and phobia? Ah, oh, trauma and phobia. Ajahn Brahm is here. <laughs> <laughs> you let it go, it's in the past. So, a lot of times, if you, trauma, phobia, and fear, oh my crikey, what? I'm, I'm, done. I'm, I'm afraid of, oh, those, those didn't make it, the answer, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> One of the ways is, the old simile of the angry eating monster, you know the angry eating monster? So, oh, come on. There was, okay, here we go, it's a full story. There was an empress, and she was at the Jhana Grove Meditation Retreat Center doing a retreat. And when she went back home to her palace, she found this huge, ugly, frightening monster and actually walked right into her palace. And he, the monster was so terrifying that all the guards of security, you know, they just froze in terror. They hid under the table. They went behind the flower pots. They went in the cupboards, in the broom cupboards. They hid because they were terrified. This monster, this demon was really scary. And that allowed the monster to go right into the palace, right in the emperor's, empress's throne. And this, there was this monster sitting in the empress's throne. That's where the guards and the soldiers and the people who are supposed to be looking after the palace, they said, you've gone too far. Get out. Now. Out. Now those few unkind words, that monster grew an inch bigger, more ugly, more stinky, and more frightening. And that really made him upset. Get out now or else. You better get out. And every unkind word, unkind deed, unkind thought, the monster just kept getting bigger, uglier, smellier, and more frightening. And by the time the empress came back from the retreat at Jarnava, she was so peaceful, so wise. And she saw this monster <laughs> at her. And it stank. It stank so badly. There were actually maggots crawling on the monster's skin and vomiting, throwing up. Even the maggots couldn't stand the <laughs> stinky smell. <laughs> and it was huge. And the empress. As soon as she saw this, <laughs> okay, it doesn't matter. Come on, carry on. You can carry on. As soon as the Empress saw this, she said, Welcome, monster. Ah, oh, thank you for coming. Why have you waited so long? Has anyone got you a cup of tea yet? We have tea with condensed milk, like Ajahn Brahm likes. <laughs> Or oh, would you prefer something healthy like chamomile or peppermint? Would you like something to eat? You know, not just cheese and chocolate. We've actually got some stuff, some, some mama noodles for you. <laughs> <laughs> we, oh, would you like some pizza? Because they can get takeaway pizza for you, it won't take that long to deliver. 
monster size. They do monster <laughs> size pizza, yeah. <laughs> monster pizza. And this, this um, empress, she was legitimately kind. She wasn't faking it. She was really uh, wanting to make sure that the monster was actually giving some hospitality. And at those kind words, the monster grew a little bit smaller, less ugly, less of a pain, and was less smelly. So all the people realized what they were doing wrong. They're always giving it anger. Instead, they gave it kindness. Little monster, do you want a little bit of cushion in your back? Would you like a, a, a shoulder massage? Because this monster got these huge heads. Imagine just the neck ache they must get. So they gave them a nice massage. Oh, just there. Uh, just uh, Do you want a little bit of oil on that? Some nice oil. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's really <laughs> nice. <laughs> and they were so kind to this monster. Every kind act, kind word, or even kind thought. And this monster started shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Until the monster was so small. Same size as when it first came in. They carried on with the kindness. A couple of the, the ministers gave it a foot massage. Oh, just like that. You never had a foot massage? Just, oh, just, just there. Yeah, oh, 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 yeah. Ooh, <laughs> mm, that's nice. Yeah. And so <laughs> the monster grew so small that one more act of kindness and the monster vanished completely away. That's based on a story in the uh, in the Uda, no, it's actually in the uh, Yaka Samyutta, Nikaya, the Sutta, called the Anger Eating Monster. They feed on anger. Give them anger, they get bigger, uglier. You may know someone who's a boss at work who's an anger eating monster. Ugh, you give them anger back, Ugh, and they get. Ugh. So the more anger you give them, the bigger they get, and the uglier they get, and the more frightening they get. So give them kindness, and they start to vanish. They vanish completely away. That is trauma. That is, what else is this? Um, phobia. Be kind to them. Thank you for coming to visit me, trauma. You want a cup of tea? <laughs> sure. You find it actually gets less. Jajabam, this morning you said many things which resonated with me, including give up, let go, stop trying to get somewhere, stop aiming for stuff, planning of limited or no use. Regrettably, I live in 21st century Hong Kong and not in Buddha era Bodh Gaya. Where do you think I live? I live in many places. Jada Grove, go to Hong Kong, go to Jakarta. So yeah, give up and let go. Now is the time for you to give up and let go. Now, when you go to work, then you relax. You're ready to go. You're re-energized. So we learn how to, we don't know how to strive, but do you know how to just relax? Now's the time to relax, to recharge your batteries. Within the environment of above, there are may arise Fundamental needs to set and enforce boundaries, fine. To announce and remind them that you are not a mop for, uh, or a free ATM machine, fine. Otherwise, much hurt and grief is likely to be enlisted on yourself and those around you, finding limited in this life. Yeah, of course. You just say, no. You know the story of the ATM machine. True story. So if ever you're short of cash, Try this. One of the Anagarikas here. He was here for one year, and then he went over to Frankfurt to carry on with his studies. And I met him over there a few years ago. He told me this story. He said, honestly, absolutely true. First day on the campus from Frankfurt University, or one of the universities there, he was went out for his lunch, you know, take some sandwiches. He wasn't a rich, he was a very poor student. And he sat down on a bench in the sunshine and he passed the ATM machine. And the ATM machine 
made a sound, a gurgling sound, he called it. And he interpreted that as the ATM machine was welcoming him onto campus. And so he smiled and said thank you to the ATM machine. And he'd always have his lunch there. And a few weeks later, he was sitting there having some sandwiches next to the ATM machine, or within sound, within earshot of it. And he, no one had been close to that ATM machine for at least 20 minutes. And then he heard the familiar sound again, the gurgling sound, which he recognized as the same noise as when he first came onto campus. And he turned around to his friendly ATM machine, and then the noise continued and some whirring of wheels came out and a 20 euro note came out from the machine. <laughs> no one had been around there for 20 minutes. And so he went to the, the uh, ATM and he said he waved it. Does this belong to anybody? No one claimed it. He realized it was his. Thank you, ATM machine. Thank you so much. If you know how to be kind, if you're kind to the ATM machine, maybe <laughs> maybe they'll give you 20 bucks. <laughs> that was actually, I interrogated this man so many times that that was a true story. You don't believe it, do you, until it happens. Life is weird. But anyway, in this particular one, you don't have to be violent. But there was the story, and I mentioned this to someone, of the, the bad snake. Once upon a time, there's this very bad, mean snake. We'll bite people for fun. That's the snake's fun, not the people's fun. <laughs> a really a mean-spirited, bad, we call it bad-ass snake. That's what they say in, in the United States. Is that right, bad-ass snake? That's what he was. And anyway, after a while, that he decided, he got philosophical. Wonder what happens to snakes when they die? Do the snakes get reincarnated? You know, like, like you do? You know, do they, is there a hell realm they can go for bad snakes or a heaven realm? He, you know, he started to wonder about the meaning of life and what happens after you die. And he'd been a very bad snake, so he was really worried. So he decided to go up and see this holy snake. This holy snake lived in this... this uh, a uh, little retreat center on top of the hill. <laughs> and he went, because, you know, he had a reputation. He didn't want to sort of embarrass himself. So he wore this big hat and glasses and a raincoat. You know, go incognito. <laughs> so the bad, the bad snake went incognito up to the retreat center. Because there he saw the holy snake. This holy snake was sitting there with a bald head and a brown robe around him. <laughs> And all these little snakes were listening to everything. <laughs> <laughs> and then the bad, the holy snake started talking about, you know, life after death. And just, oh yeah, you know, if you're a good person according to your karma, you're getting a nice rebirth. If you're a bad person, oh, better watch out. One of the wonderful things to do is to be kind, keep precepts, be virtuous, buy precepts. And so the bad snake was really, he got converted. This made so much sense to him. And so he took off his, his, uh, his uh, hat and his jacket and his sunglasses and he went, wow, bad snakes here as well. That's amazing. And the bad snake went right up to the front and said, give me the five precepts. I want to change my life. I'm going to be a good Buddhist snake from now on. So I gave him the five precepts, you know, Parnati, Pata, where am I? Adi, Nardana, where am I? And the snake he took all those precepts and he even gave a donation when he went out. <laughs> <laughs> and he became a vegetarian. <laughs> he joined Amnesty International. <laughs> he, he, was, he was a member of Greenpeace. <laughs> and, and there he was. And when people came, they didn't know he would change. Even though they saw this huge Amnesty International badge on his chest. And even though he spent all the time just meditating cross coiled in front of his, his hole. He was a you know, he was a changed snake, but people didn't realise that. Until one day someone just almost walked on him and he didn't bite. 
you know, and they was really surprised. All they did was smile religiously. So uh, in snake language, you are sick. <laughs> And then what happened? The <laughs> snake had his reputation of being just a pushover, a wimp. So there's always bad, usually bad boys. They come and let's, let's, and they started teasing him. You're not a real snake. You're just an overgrown worm. <laughs> you creep. Show us your fangs if you've got any. You haven't got any fangs, have you? And that was a very proud snake. He'd done a lot in his life. And just being bullied by these little kids, he was really upset, but he couldn't bite them. And so they started throwing things at him, and then they took sticks and hit him on the back. And he had to take the beating. He couldn't defend himself. So after the beating, he went up to see the holy snake up in the retreat center. And the holy snake saw him coming. So what happened to you? And the bad say, your fault? What do you mean my fault? Well, you may be in, in the monastery or in the retreat center, you can keep precepts, but in the world, especially in Hong Kong doing business, oh, it's just, you got to bite, you got to fight to defend yourself. And I can't do anything now because you gave me these silly precepts. Now look what happened to me. You stupid snake. You idiot snake. You nincompoop snake. Nincompoop means stupid, but it sounds good. <laughs> it's true. I told you not to bite. But I never told you not to hiss. And that's all a snake needs to do to protect itself. And still keep the precepts. If the people start giving you any trouble, <laughs> So when you go back to Hong Kong or Jakarta, wherever you go, it's okay to hiss. <laughs> <laughs> then they won't use you as a doormat. <laughs> rebirth versus heaven and hell. Is rebirth because of karma? Why would there be heaven and hell? Because that's where you send yourself. You think you deserve to be there. It's called guilt. You told us to be kind with our body and our organs. Is this a strain, inconvenience? How will you relax the organ? Is it like trying to compensate, say, kind things to it? Kind to with our body, I think our mind. Is there a strain, inconvenience? No, being kind, you relax. I, I don't know if you mean your, you know, some of your organs, like your bladder. Please don't relax your bladder <laughs> <laughs> until you get to the toilets. <laughs> I don't know if I got that one right. Never mind. I'll try another one. Dear Ajahn, in parents and kid relationships, how do to differentiate love and care? Versus attachment. I love my kids so much, my friends said I'm too attached. Of course you love your kids. You can't do much about that. That's a mother that, you know, you're attached to your kids you know, for the rest of your life. It's very hard to let your kids go. There's something which is so, so um, strong in you. But the way to do that is to, to realize they're not your kids. They come into your life. They come into your life, where they come from, previous life, you don't know, where they go to afterwards, you know that they're not yours, you just look after them for a while. And then, sometimes, you know, you don't know, so, what was that, they, uh, I can't resist this, I think I have to do this once tomorrow. But that was the story of the, the boy at school in Australia. And he was just really hard up for cash. You know, he spent all his pocket money and, and so he didn't know what to do. So he asked his friend at school, he said, what can I do to get a bit of money? He said, easy, this is what you should do. Go up to see your sister, you know, a couple of years older than you. And go up to her and just tell her, sister, I know all about it. 
try that. And so he goes out to his big sister at school and says, Sister, I know all about it. She said, What do you know? He said, I know all about it. <laughs> How did you find out? Well, I've got my friends in school. She said, Is twenty dollars enough? <laughs> said, Oh, make it thirty. <laughs> but don't tell mum and dad, okay? Okay. Because everyone's got secrets. And so this is a nice, easy way to make some money. <laughs> so then he, go, yeah, <laughs> he goes home and he sees his mum. And he goes up to his mum and says, Mum, I know all about it, mum. <laughs> well, what do you know? He said, well, you know, just, you know, some of your friends, are, you know, the parents of my friends, and, you know, we talk things about school. I know all about it, mum. Won't tell your dad? Well, maybe 50 bucks. <laughs> okay, you were not going to tell your dad, okay? I won't tell dad. And so he takes the 50 bucks. And then in the evening, <laughs> goes out to his dad. Daddy, <laughs> I know all about it. <laughs> you do? <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to tell mum. No, you better not. It costs you $100, dad. <laughs> <laughs> and he gives $100 to his son. Because, you know, people have got guilt. If I look at you, Jasmine, I know all about it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, don't tell anybody. Ah. <laughs> so he gets $100. And then and the next day, he's short of money. So who else can I ask? And it just happens that the, the postman knocks at the door. And so he goes up to the postman and says, Postman, I know all about it. <laughs> and the postman looks at him, you do? Said, yes. And the postman said, son. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> 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 okay. Anyway, <laughs> keep your sense of humor. Um, okay, I'll just do one more and then we'll see what we've got. Dear Ajahn Brahm, from today's sutra class, brain triggers will, triggers action. What triggers the brain? What triggers the brain is something which happened earlier. It just goes round and round in circles. If you have an action, and then that's sort of if it's uh, something pleasant, you know, you want it again. If it's unpleasant, you're trying to get rid of it. So a lot of this stuff is just um, uh, going round and round again like uh, Pavlov's dogs. You ring the bell and people just bow. Okay? What are you going to do? Great, you're not that conditioned. <laughs> <laughs> but if it was a lunch bell, That'd be a different matter altogether. Okay, but that's what happens. It's just that condition. You just go back and you find out that it was caused from something before. This afternoon, you stated that past life regression helps people, and in particular, one naval officer in Western Australia. You did not say how or by what mechanism do you wish to say anything about that. It's just like you, uh, it's just uh, standard methods of relaxing a person and then just getting them very slowly to go back into their past life. So many different like uh, little ways. Going down a staircase and there's a door. This is just going very fast. Going through a door and then what's on the other side? You know, getting people relaxed, confident, safe, and then see if you can get some memories from a previous life. Expense aside, would you recommend such therapy generally? Yeah, it works. There's no real... Uh, problems there. Are there pra particular individuals, practitioners who you would recommend? There's many of them. But even over in uh, Singapore, that Andrew Monksfield is doing that sort of stuff now and it does work. So you can actually find out regression therapies. And sometimes it's amazing. You get, there was this, um, this young girl, 16, now this is the really amazing, interesting stuff. 16 years of age, and she was anorexic. 
I mean, really very dangerously anorexic that uh, doctors, psychologists uh, could not really help her. And she was just fading away. She was dying. And just out of uh, desperation that she, uh, uh, the mother took her to a, a regression therapist to hypnotize her, maybe get her into a past life, find out what the cause was. Because she was only 16, the mother had to be with her at all times, by law. And so anyway, that she was easy to hypnotize, and she got back into a previous life, so she claimed, where she was the younger of two sisters, who both fell in love with the same guy. They both loved this guy, elder sister and younger sister, and the older sister was more attractive. The younger sister was more plain, ordinary looking. So boys being boys, in this particular case, the guy married the elder sister. And the younger sister was heartbroken. So much so that she committed suicide. And she said that that was her previous life. And that's why she was trying so hard, desperately hard, to be attractive you know, by being thin she thought that would stop her having to endure that incredible suffering in the previous life of being broken hearted because not being attractive enough would cause her to commit suicide. And that was, you know, it's reasonable, logical, but what really was the amazing part of this story was when the mother was hearing this with all the details of what happened, the mother started crying and sobbing and the mother became hysterical. And this poor psychologist, psychiatrist, had to deal with getting the young lady out of uh, uh, hypnosis and then dealing with the mother who was just going bananas. And then she asked the mother, once she comes out, what's happening? At which point the mother said, I was that sister. I never told my daughter this. She was born sort of after my sister died. We both fell in love with the same guy. I married him. My sister, who I never told anything about to my daughter, she was the one who killed herself. She could not be the wife of this man, so she came back as the daughter. At least she was close to him. But trying desperately to be attractive because being unattractive would cause her so much suffering. Of course, once they saw that, it made logical sense, but it worked afterwards. So there was no problem afterwards. Okay. One last question. Thank you for the wonderful teachings. I know old monk won't lie. Do you really know Princess Diana has reincarnated? Is she <laughs> in the human realm now? Where is she? <laughs> well, there's not enough time to say now. <laughs> So we'll finish now. I'll do this once tomorrow because <laughs> there's not enough time. It's just well, or shall I carry on? Okay. Now, Jan, can you say more on the mind creates our world and drives rebirth? And why did the Buddha not say more on sexuality being uh, our inversion of perception? Uh, the mind creates our world and drives rebirth. Yeah, this mind is the biggest thing in the whole world. And so it does drive things. We make our world much more than we think. Like you can see even an extreme example of that is, is someone like a Donald Trump. who says, no, no, I never said that. was the biggest organization in the whole world. So I'm the most popular. We had this wonderful meeting, <coughs> you know, with Kim Jong-un. And you know, we're bit, sometimes there's a lot of delusion there. Seeing things which are not there, simply because we want to see things. How much does the mind create? You see what you want to see. And you don't see what you can't, what you don't like seeing. That was that story from my mate, Professor Bernard Carr, uh, close disciple of Stephen Hawkins. 
is also into psychic phenomena. And this particular experiment, the flower pot experiment, one of his friends, a top physicist in London, advertised that he discovered the secret of levitation. And he was going to levitate a flower pot in Imperial College, London, in front of everybody in laboratory conditions. And so he got uh, all the, the cameras and photographs and infrared machines, so if anything was funny going on, they could see it. And he had a lot of his, his um, top friends, lecturers, professors, sitting in the lecture theater to watch this demonstration. It's only because he was a well-known physicist that he could actually get all these people to come and watch this. And he got them in to the lecture theater, and he came in walking, carrying a flower pot. No strings. And he put it on the lecture table. And then he said he needed everybody's assistance to create the right atmosphere. He asked all his lecturers and professors to start chanting, Om. Not the Mani Padme Hum, just Om. That was enough. Om. Om, and they all were chanting Om, and the flower pot rose up into the air. It levitated. It rose. And they photographed it, they videoed it, and afterwards they asked the people in the audience, what do you think of that? And a number of those trained observational experimenters they replied, what are you talking about? The flower pot never rose in the air. It stayed on the table all the time. It never rose. But here's a photograph, fake. I was watching with my own eyes. It didn't move. That's what they reported. Top trained observers in science. But then they told what actually really happened. What really happened was that after they started chanting, they turned on a switch. There was this huge electromagnet under the desk, which they couldn't see. And you should all know, even though you may not be scientists, when you turn on a very strong current, it makes a humming sound. They had to do om, 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 to mask the fact that now a big, strong current is going through somewhere. But the point was, it did rise in the air. It was not about levitation. It was about perception. Because many of these were people who'd made their reputation as experimenters, trying to be objective observers. But having a flower pot rise into the air was so contradictory to what they thought was possible. They didn't even see it. It did not register on their conscious awareness. We block things out before we are even aware of them. That was the whole point of the experiment on perception. If something is just totally impossible to our worldview, we won't even see it. That was great. And that was Good old Bernard Carr, great experiment. So that's how the mind creates our world, and that is how we perceive what we want to see. Much more than you'd ever expect. Dear Ajahn, currently there are a lot of spiritual teachings online given by some people who claim to be the medium of higher beings like Creon, Abraham, Hicks. Hicks, who's Hicks? Oh, Hicks, that's the guy who entered the, the uh, when you have... Uh, uh, sneezes and coughs, Hicks, cough lozenges, isn't it? Or Hicks, vapor. Hicks, or Hicks, Hicks lozenges, or the, I don't know, anyway. Hicks, etc. My good friend who is spiritually much more advanced than me, having jhanas, what I don't have, are you sure? Told me that they are wise teachers. Oh, that means he hasn't got jhanas. I dare not to listen to YouTube, she said, since I am not wise enough to differentiate if they are good or not. Would you kindly share your views on these spiritual teachings and give me guidance? Oh, these people 
If they're channeling to you, are they real, are they, are they not? So, most of the time, not. <laughs> this person, this person, he had this, this channel, this, this spirit. You recognize it, it's probably his grandfather. And his grandfather told him, Go to the casino. Go to the casino. Who said that? He looked around, no one's in the room. He wasn't imagining it because he heard it again. Go. He recognizes his grandfather's voice. Maybe the grandfather was helping him. So he went to the casino. And then when he went in, the voice said, Go to roulette table. Go to roulette table. Oh, he went to roulette table. He said, Go put ten dollars on number sixteen. Ten dollars on number sixteen. No one else heard it, only he, he did. So he put ten dollars on number sixteen. And the croupier threw in the ball, twirled the wheel, and it went round, 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 and it landed on number sixteen. And he could hear the spirit say, Yeah, yes. No one else heard that. And the spirit said, put all the money on number 12. Put it all on number 12. They put it all on number 12. And the croupier threw in the wheel, took, not the wheel, took the ball, twirled the wheel, went round, 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 and it stopped on number 12. Yeah, yeah, woohoo! And then the spirit said, and now put all the number on number six, number six, everything. That was a lot of money. So you see, everybody was actually crowding around him now. Now, this, if you won, this is really going to be a lot of money. And the spirit said, number six, number six. Put it on number six, yes. So he put it on number six. And the, the croupier threw in the ball. Rolled away, went round, round, round. It went round, round, almost interminably. And it fell on number six. Then it jumped out onto number 11. <laughs> And the spirit he was channeling said, oh, shit. <laughs> the meaning of that story is that he might channel the spirit, but they don't always get it right. So be very careful. If it doesn't make any sense, then just no, don't do it. So use your intelligence when you channel spirits. But don't always do what they tell you. Dear Ajahn Brahm, is only is my understanding up uh, below understanding correct? Mind consciousness needs to be separated from other five consciousness, and then mind consciousness needs to be empty or no thought. Is this the purpose of meditation? Is guess I guess enlightenment comes after this. It's you know a little bit in brief. When you can see what mind consciousness is, and the other five consciousness disappears. Number one, when the five consciousness disappears, then you're really blissing out. And of course, by that time, there'll be no thought. It won't be empty, it'll be full of bliss and stillness and power. And that gives you, it's not the purpose of meditation, it's the means of meditation, whereby you really empower your mind and you get new data and you can actually see things so much more clearly. I keep falling asleep during meditation. May you advise how to deal with drowsiness in meditation. Yes, go to bed. <laughs> Take a break. <laughs> if, my, if my consciousness can be expect, if my consciousness be, can be separated from physical body, can it float around outside the body? I have heard that some Indian saints ages ago moved from one living species to another and came back in their own body. Could it be true or myth? Yeah, that can be done. But why, why do you do that? You know, just having your own body is good enough. And also, oh, there's people actually, um, just down the road, Karnat Prison Farm. There was this guy, a Yugoslavia fellow, and he uh, told me that, you know, he didn't mind being in jail. It didn't matter at all to him being in prison, because he could leave whenever he wanted. He just lay on his bed and astral travel. Go and see a movie, go and see a football match, they go and see a, a live performance of a band. And, uh, and he was you know, true about this. 
He said, what happened when he was a young boy, five or six years of age, in Yugoslavia, when he was still under the communist, that you know, something was wrong with him. He had an operation. And while he was on the, on the operating table, he died, you know, temporarily. And he was floating above his, his uh, body. And he said he could see the doctors. They were just, they realized they were panicking because he stopped. Uh, the heart stopped and it looked all the signs of life had gone. And he knew, he said it was a weird experience, he knew what was wrong with him and the doctors were looking in the wrong place in his body. And so he just will, one of the doctors, don't look there, look here. And as soon as he did that, as soon as he willed it, the doctor just, went, oh there it is, that's a problem. And that saved his life. And then ever since that time he said he could astral travel, leave his body whenever he wanted to. For most people, you know, it's not really important. But for him, it was really helpful being in jail. <laughs> they, they couldn't keep him inside. They thought he was inside, his body was in the cell, but he was out enjoying himself. Interesting, isn't it? Anyway, the last question. I'm often told I should find my purpose or my mission in life. How do I find my purpose without becoming attached to it? Thank you. You've got to find it for, first before you become attached to it, so find it first, and your purpose in life is to find your purpose. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the giggles. <laughs> okay, that's enough, but that's all the questions. What, some at the end I didn't, answer properly, please excuse me, because it's getting a bit late. So anyway, I hope you go to bed with a smile tonight. <laughs> sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And sorry for being a bit over time again, but it's not my fault, it's just too many questions. Okay, we'll have a beautiful night, see you in the morning.